Again, welcome to our guests. Thank you for choosing to worship with us today, for being here to support your children and your families. I recognize that uh, as the preacher I, I, who tends to preach in series, it can be hard to enter in at, after the start of a series and, and not have a whole lot of context. So I'm going to give you just a little bit of context of where we as a church have been for a couple of weeks here so that you don't feel completely lost. Uh, I don't want to lose anybody. We want everybody to arrive safely at the Super Bowl event at the very end. So let's, uh, let's take a minute and talk about what we're doing here as a church. We, we have identified a theme for our church this year, and that theme is on the cover of your bulletin. It is the theme of dreaming. Now, when we talk about dreaming, we're not talking about the things that your brain is doing at night while you sleep. No, we are talking about taking a season in the life of our church and asking God to reveal to us his future for our church. We want God to share with us his dreams, his visions, the things he would have us to be and to do. And so we're going to take four, five, six, seven weeks to start out the year to explore different facets of this topic. And so today, as we continue in this series, we are in Genesis chapter 12. So if you have your Bibles there, we're going we're gonna to read here in a moment the first nine verses of that chapter. This is the story of when God called Abram, who was later to be named Abraham, and this is God's call upon his life. Now, two weeks ago, we were in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2, and we talked about the very goodness of God's creation. However, between Genesis chapter 3 and then Genesis chapter 11, things have come unraveled. Sin has entered into God's perfect world and has corrupted everything that it touches. And by the end of chapter 11, if you're reading from, from, from page 1 of the Bible and you're reading through, by the time you get to chapter 11, sin and wickedness has become such a problem that it is now spread across the entire earth. So chapter 11 ends with a very sour, desperate, universal scope. In perspective. Sin has corrupted creation. But that wide angle lens of chapter 11 begins to zoom in very tightly in chapter 12 onto one man. This one man by whose offspring all the families on the earth would be blessed. In chapter 12, the God who called the cosmos and, and all that exists into existence is now going to begin to call a community into being. And you cannot understand the Bible, and I mean this, you cannot understand the Bible apart from this story. Because the destiny of all of humankind is wrapped up in the future of this one single family. So let's now take a look here at this very important story that begins in chapter 12, verse 1 of Genesis. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your native country your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. So... Abram departed as the Lord had instructed, and Lot, his nephew, went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all his wealth, his livestock, and all the people he had taken into his household at Haran, and headed for the land of Canaan. When they arrived in Canaan, Abram traveled through the land as far as Shechem. There he set up camp beside the oak of Morah. At that time, the era, area was inhabited by Canaanites. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I will give this land to your descendants. And Abram built an altar there and dedicated it to the Lord who had appeared to him. After that, Abram traveled south and set up camp in the hill country with Bethel to the west and Ai to the east. There he built another altar and dedicated it to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord. 
Then Abram continued traveling south by stages toward the Negev. When I was in high school, I received God's call upon my life to ministry. I had no idea what that meant. I really didn't. I'm thankful that when God revealed that call to my life that he didn't disclose it in full because I'm pretty sure I would have chickened out and probably not gone very far into the calling. But I sensed somewhere deep in my heart that the Lord was calling me to give my life to him in service. And I didn't know what that would look like, but I knew that what he was saying and I wanted to follow him. And so as the years began to pass and I began to to see where, where this call would take me, I ended up in Bible college. That was quite an experience. But it was a good experience. It was important in the formation of my faith and in my understanding of the Bible. Gave me tools that I needed to to be able to minister to others. During this time, I I met my wife. We got married, finished college, and, and, uh, well, you say the rest is history. But something happened to me when I was in college. As I was trying to fulfill God's call upon my life, over that period of time, I was also getting very close to my brother's. I have two older brothers and an older sister, but my brothers and I are especially close, and and my best friend from high school was like my third brother, and so the four of us, who all kind of lived within about 10 minutes of each other at the time, maybe a half hour at the most, um, we we spent all of our time together, and we we became very close, and my wife, after she and I became married, and we, we were still finishing college, we began to put roots down, and we found ourselves becoming very comfortable and very happy with our new life together. And during my, my, my time in, in college, it became clear that God was calling me to go from college into seminary, which is basically graduate school for, for, for people who are called to ministry. And I knew exactly where he was calling me to go. He was calling me to leave Ohio and go all the way to the deep south to Jackson, Mississippi. Listen, you have to be called to go to Jackson, Mississippi. And so I said yes to the call and... Uh, and that was the plan. However, as, as my, my, my connection with my brothers got deeper and deeper, and as my, my wife and I began to become more and more comfortable there in our new life together, I, I noticed that the closer the time came to go, the harder it became. And so in that year, right before we were scheduled to leave, I caught wind of the, the possibility that the seminary I was scheduled to go to might offer their their master's degree online. And suddenly I saw a possibility. Maybe, maybe I can fulfill God's call on my life. Maybe I can attend the seminary and never leave home. Maybe if they do launch this online program, I can can maintain my, my comfort. I can stay where I'm familiar. I can stay close to the people that I love and the people who who matter most to me. And and I don't have to uproot and transfer across the country. And so I I was faced with a dilemma. Do I stick with the plan? Do we stick with the plan? Or do we risk the plan by hoping for this online program to take off? Now, because of this experience, and I'll give you the rest of the story at the end. You have to wait Because of this experience in my life, I have always felt a particular closeness to Abram in this story. You see, from my perspective and my own experience, the the things that God was calling me to do seem very similar to the things God was calling Abram to do. Abram, he says there in verse 1, leave your native country, leave your relatives, leave your father's family. In other words, leave behind everything you know. Leave your your comforts, leave your familiarity, leave your security. In many ways, leave even your identity behind and go. Now, you Coast Guard and military families know all about the challenges of being uprooted and moved, don't you? Military families, we see them all the time. For for five years, I've watched family after family move into the area and they they go through all the hassle of finding a place to live and, and finding a school for their kids and finding a church for them to attend and and they get, in, they get invested, they get involved, they, they, the, the roots of their lives begin to sink into the ground and they become comfortable and then they're told to go. And so you Coast Guard, you military families, who that's, if that's part of your life, I want to tell you, first of all, thank you for your service. But thank you also for being willing to submit yourselves to that. It's never easy. I can relate. 
I wasn't a military kid growing up, but I was the next closest thing to it. My dad worked for IBM. Over the years, we came to, to, uh, to, to describe IBM as, a, as meaning I've been moved. Because dad was moved all the time. In fact, I believe by the time I, I was in the middle of fourth grade, um, I had been in five different elementary schools in two different states and multiple places within each of those states. We, we moved around all the time. And over the years, it got harder and harder to move. You know, when you're a kid, you, you kind of don't, you don't know what's going on all the time, and you, you're not as c- connected to people around you as, as you are to your family, and you just kind of follow your family. You don't have a whole lot of say in the matter. But the older you get, the more you begin to develop your own identity, right? By the time I was a junior in high school, I, I had finally, we had lived in one place for six years. It was the longest I'd ever lived in any one place in all my life. I, I, I had friends. I, had, I, had, I was involved in sports. I had plans. I, I, this was my home. And then comes the news, we got to move. And that became a major crisis in my life. That may be why the call to go to Mississippi a number of years later was so hard. Because I never had home before. And, and the home at that time was, at that point, was then the longest I'd ever lived in any place at that point as well. It's hard to uproot and to go. But guess what else? The call on Abram's life was more than just uproot and go. Look at the second half of verse 1. Not only is God saying, hey, leave your native country, leave your relatives, leave your father's family, but also he says, and go to the place that I will show you. (laughs) Abram doesn't even know exactly where he's going yet. There's this element of mystery in God's call. God's only calling him to leave, but to go somewhere that hasn't fully been identified to him yet. Sure, God is promising some pretty nice rewards here, but I have to say, It takes a certain kind of faith to step out like Abram did here without seeing all of the end in advance. I think what's being asked of him here is hard for anybody. You don't have to be in the Coast Guard or the military or be the son of of an, an IBM guy to understand the challenges of an uncertain future, to understand the risks of potentially losing your security. Every one of us in here has to think every day about what happens if the money dries up? What happens if the market crashes again? What happens if something happens to my health and and I can no longer work at the same level and and my earning potential decreases? What happens if the breadwinner in the family for some reason becomes disabled or, or even passes away? What happens here in a week or two if the government shuts down again? I mean, these are these are questions. That, that are on our minds and our hearts all the time? What happens when that network of support that you've come to lean upon in your life begins to fall apart? If you've never had that happen to you before, I can tell you it can be scary when the people that you rely upon are no longer there for you. The people who are on your side, perhaps they even turn on you. How about as a church? We're no different than any other church. We face our our challenges and our obstacles. We've we've had uncertainty. We've had adversity. And it's it's hard. It's hard when when our comfort and our in our way of doing things and the things that we rely upon are suddenly in jeopardy. For whatever reason, we as as people are inclined to, to seek and settle into comfort and familiarity, aren't we? We don't like change in our lives. And in fact, once we've really settled into the groove or that, that, that comfort zone that we like, we don't just settle there, we, we cling to it. It's hard to let that go. But the, the truth of the matter is, every time I, I see this happening in Scripture, it seems as though God wants to disrupt the comfort when He is about to move in someone's life. When God is about to do something incredible, both at the personal level and at the corporate level, God wants to disrupt those things, that, those crutches that we lean on, those, those things that we look to for security or comfort or even pleasure. And God says, no, you cannot depend on those things. And so as we as a church and, and as all of us as individuals are tasked with imagining God's future for our church and for our lives, that we have to be aware that that doesn't necessarily mean that his future brings more comfort or that his future is easier. What it does mean 
is trusting Him. It does mean obeying Him, even when it's uncomfortable, even when it's inconvenient, even when it's a little scary. Jesus said, you cannot truly follow God unless you are willing to deny yourself of your way of doing things, of the things that you have sought for comfort, the things that you have leaned upon. If you're not willing to turn away from those things, to deny those things, you cannot truly follow God. He said it himself in this much quoted pa uh, passage from Matthew 16. You've probably all heard it many times and maybe even know it by heart. Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, any of you, doesn't matter your, your family, doesn't matter your experiences, doesn't matter what you've come to define yourself by or who you are, any of you, if you want to be my follower, you have to give up your own way. You have to take up your own cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will find it. What do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Saying yes to Jesus, following Jesus, and receiving the blessings that result first require a fundamental saying no to yourself. I cannot say yes to him and yes to me at the same time. I cannot say yes to his invitation to follow him and receive all that he has to offer, all the blessings, all the benefits of life with God, and yet still cling to my way of doing things, cling to my, my crutches, cling to my sense of security, cling to my self-sufficiency. And so for you, individuals listening this morning, or listening online, or anywhere else you hear the sound of my voice right now, you, EMC, as a church, are you willing as we enter the season of dreaming, are you willing to say no to yourself that you might follow Jesus wherever he leads? Every one of us this morning, whether you're a part of this church or whether you're a guest, has to answer that question at some point in your life. If you have any desire whatsoever to follow the Lord, you have to say know to yourself first. Are you willing to do that? Abram's response here in, the, in this chapter has, has, goes on to become the standard by which all faith in the rest of the Bible is judged. You want to know what faith is? Look right here. You want to understand what biblical faith looks like? Genesis chapter 12. And in verse 4, I love how simple it says, just as matter of fact, so Abraham, Abram departed as the Lord had instructed. The call upon Abram was not just to believe God's word. It was to do what God said. It wasn't just trust. It was also obedience. And that right there, to me, is the simplest definition of faith. It's trusting obedience. It's taking God at his word and doing what God's word says. And in a world gone mad where the wickedness of humankind has spread to the ends of the earth, one man perceived the truth that the God who uttered the call is the one who's able to stand behind the promises. And that's the key to faith. Faith is able to see God for who he is even before God completes all the things he says he's going to do. Abram is not stepping out in response to this long, long um, history of God fulfilling everything God was going to do in his life. No, the promise is if you go, then you will experience this in your life. And Abram trusted that. I trust him. I know enough about his character in his heart, and who he's revealed himself to be up to this point, to know that I can take this step. He will keep his word. And I'm willing to commit whatever I have to do to see it fulfilled in my life. What a radical departure this is from what goes on back in chapter 3. You remember the story. 
in the, this, this paradise, this, this garden sanctuary where God has, has brought his, his own presence to, to dwell upon the earth in the midst of, of paradise, a serpent slithers into the scene and into the hearts of the first man and woman. And that serpent managed to call into question God's truthfulness. He was able to get them to question and to doubt the intentions of God. And from that, that, that introduction of doubt, it, it, distrust began to be cultivated in their hearts. Can God be taken at his word? Is it possible that God, that God doesn't mean what he says? Or maybe God's withholding something from me? Suddenly God's, all of God's intentions are in question. And it's a short step from there to outright disobedience resulting in death. But here, in Genesis chapter 12, is the opposite of that. God's word comes to Abram and it, it captures Abram's heart and it prompts him to trust and obey. And the result? Life and blessing. Through one man's disobedience, sin reached to the ends of the earth by chapter 11. But by one man's faith, blessing would, he, would ultimately be extended to the ends of the earth. You see the difference there. It couldn't be more clear to me. And in Abram's simple response of yes to God, the cycle of sin's dominance was broken. And the potential for recreation became realized in his life. And friends, I want to tell you the, that same power of faith that was in work, that was at work in Abram's life, is available in your life and in mine. You may be sitting here this morning. I don't know what all of your experiences are. I don't know where everybody is in their understanding of God or their walk with God. But, but everyone here, no matter where you are on the spectrum, you may be tempted to think, I can never have faith like that. I can never trust God to the point where I'm willing to leave everything behind. I can never really obey Jesus' word to take up a cross and die to myself and follow him. That may be true of some hero, some patriarch in the Bible. It may be true of some pastor somewhere or some really holy saint person somewhere, but not of me. I can never do that. Well, let me tell you, that same power of faith not only can be at work in your life, but it must be. Without faith, without saying no to me and yes to God, it is impossible to please God. You cannot please God by fulfilling some checklist of do's and don'ts. That's not enough. You can never check off enough things to earn God's favor upon your life. But when we say yes to Him in faith, no matter how rough our lives are, no matter how much we've screwed up, no matter how wrong we are, no matter how much we struggle, if we say yes to Him, that invites his pleasure. Paul says that without faith, you can't receive God's grace. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. Faith is how you receive what God is offering you. Faith is not you performing at such a level that finally God grants you permission to come to heaven. Faith is nothing more than a response to what he has done. What Jesus has done. What God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit has done for you. You respond to that with faith. Paul says in Romans chapter 1, I am not ashamed of the good news about Jesus. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes. If Jesus died for all the world and if God wishes no one to perish, then how do some go to heaven and some go to hell? Well, only those who believe receive the benefits of his death on the cross. It's only when we respond in faith, the good news tells us, Paul continues, how God makes us right in his sight, accomplished from start to finish by faith. It's faith at the beginning, it's faith at the end. As the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. You may be one of those people who's really good at following the rules. And the temptation for people like that is to think that by my, my following the rules, by my keeping all the, all the stuff, 
that somehow God must be really happy with me. And let me, let me, I'm sure it does make God happy when we keep his rules. But your works can never save you. The things we do toward God or for God are all only ever a response to what he's done for us and a working out of our faith in him. Jesus, I believe you died for me. I believe you, you're calling me to yourself. I trust you and I will obey you. And from that flows a life of obedience, a life of whatever, whatever he calls you to do. So the question for you and for me every day, but especially this morning, do you trust the word of God? Do you trust the things that he has promised? Do you, do you, are you willing to obey the things that he says for you to be and for do? Do you have faith like Abram? Well, if you can say yes to that, then praise be to God. But if you say no to that, I invite you this morning to behold the brokenness in the world. But not just the brokenness in the world, the brokenness in your own life. If we're being, being really honest with ourselves, if we can step out for just a moment and be objective, we, we can see that our lives ultimately are a mess apart from God. And once you're willing to truly behold the brokenness of your life, I hope you're able to come to terms with the fact that you have no power within yourself to do anything about it. Yeah, we have some self-help tools out there and people, we've talked about New Year's resolutions and all that. People want to be better, better versions of themselves and they, okay, but at the end of the day, the real trouble in the human heart, the real problem that exists at the center, at the core of every one of us in here can only be fixed by God. And so as you come to terms with it, that fact that you cannot fix yourself, you cannot heal the brokenness in your life, I invite you to trust Jesus. Trust him to be who he says he is, to obey him in what he says to do. Repent, he says. Turn away from that stuff. Quit grasping for your comfort. Quit grasping for security. Quit trying to manage your own life. Quit trying to save yourself. And believe in me, Jesus said. And follow me. Follow me. No one said that that would be easy. Anyone who tells you following Jesus is easy is a fool or a liar. The next chapter in Abram's life illustrates the difficulty of saying yes to God on an ongoing basis. Because no sooner does he say yes in chapter 12, he struggles with that with saying yes in chapter 13. The end of chapter 12, you're not even in chapter 13 yet, just the end of chapter 12, he's struggling. It's hard to say yes over and over and over again. And yet, when the truth of God's word collides with the power of God's spirit, it not only awakens and kindles faith in the human heart, but it gives us power to respond. You can move towards God. In a, in a, when he enables you by his grace, you who were dead, you who were enslaved to sin, you who were worthy of condemnation, Jesus wants to touch your life and say, wake up. Wake up out of that sleep. I, I, I will bring you to a place where you can say yes to me. Every moment of every day, you can follow me, not on your own strength, but on my strength at work in your life. You can say yes, and you can say yes and you can say yes again and again in your life. You don't have to say no to him ever again. The call to follow Jesus as individual people or even as a church as a whole just might mean stepping out in faith without ever fully knowing where it's going to end. It's scary following Jesus. I don't know where he's taking me. He's, it's a land that he, will, he has yet to show me. I had no idea 15 years ago that I'd be standing in a pulpit preaching to a bunch of wonderful people such as yourself. For years, listen to me, for years, I told anyone I talked to about the call of God upon my life, I will never be a pastor. Not that there's anything wrong with being a pastor. 
But I, I just, I never dreamed in my wildest imagination that God would have, in my only experience with pastoral ministry, I was a total failure. I gave and gave and gave for four and a half years to a little youth group in the middle of a, a cornfield in central Ohio. And I came away broken and discouraged and convinced that God's call could not mean that upon my life. Obviously, he's calling me to something totally different. And so, I followed Jesus to where I thought he was leading me. I thought I'd be teaching in some college somewhere. I really did. Let me tell you something. Following Jesus is scary. <laughs> you don't know where he's going to take you. But I can promise you, even though it's scary, it is always good. Always good. He knows how he created you. He knows what is best for you. He knows what alone can bring fulfillment and meaning and purpose into your life. And it may be hard. It may be uncomfortable. It may require sacrifice. You as a person, or we as a church, as we follow God, as he leads us as a church, we may be stripped of all the things that we've come to rely upon and the things that make us feel comfortable, the things that we're familiar with. But listen, people of faith always respond in trusting obedience to the call of God, no matter the cost. As I reflected on Abram's story as it relates to our theme of dreaming, I think the hardest part in it all might come in verse 7. Verse 7. Take a look. If you have your Bible, look in chapter 12, verse 7. He finally arrives in Canaan, the, the promised land. And God, the first thing God says to him when he appears in verse 7, I will give this land to your descendants. What are we to make of this? What are we to do when the fruit of our faithfulness belongs to someone else? God didn't call Abram's descendants to uproot and go to this new place. No, God called Abram to do it. He was the one who chose. He was the one who had faith. He's the one who, who ripped up all the roots and transported himself to a place he wasn't even sure where he was going. And yet the fruit of that, the benefit of that, goes to someone else. Help me make sense of this, God. What am I supposed to do with this? How are we, how are we today supposed to understand this God who says to Abram, you follow me and I will bless your children. How do we make sense of that? Well, I think a lot of churches today, you all have probably been in one at some point in your life. Maybe you're part of one now. All of us have experienced a church that struggles with this very issue. And I'll boil this issue down to one word. And it's a, it's a hard word for me to say. Selfish. Selfishness. I think a lot of churches, perhaps your own church, if you're a guest here today, struggle with selfishness. A whole church full of people who think everything that goes on here is about me. From the songs that are sung to the color of the chairs of the carpet to what the sign says out by the road, to what things go out in, a, in a, a, an all-church email and what things don't. To what kind of soup to eat at the Super Bowl. Fill in the blank. It's all about me. It's what I want. It's what I think is best. It's what I think works. It's what we've always done. Churches where God provides a dream and a vision one that results, that, that will result in the blessings of an entire another generation. And the people say no. That is the response of every dying church. No. It's too hard. It's too uncomfortable. It costs too much money. It's not the way we've always done it. Churches that refuse to dream beyond themselves have signed their own death certificate. 
I'll tell you right now, I have no interest in being a part of a church like that. I won't do it. And praise be to God, this church is not like that. Praise be to God, this church is here today because of the selflessness of those who have come before us. I sense that every single time I step into the chapel over there. Every time I kneel to pray at that rail, God brings to my mind the, just the, the magnitude of, of countless thousands of hours of people praying for us who aren't even alive anymore. People who, who by their blood and their, their sweat and their tears and their prayers invested not in themselves but in the generation to come. People who weren't focused on themselves or what they want or what makes them comfortable but what God wants. Not for them, but for the next generation to come. And you and I today, EMC, and you guess, just by virtue of being here, you, all of us, are enjoying the fruit and the benefits of those who came first. Two, year, two years ago in, in June, on June 21st, will be my, the two-year anniversary of when I was installed as, or elected pastor here. So almost two, a year and a half ago, I stepped into a really great situation. A church full of amazing, giving, loving, godly people. Healthy and vibrant. God's hand of blessing just pouring out. It's been a, the most amazing ride for the last year and a half. But guess what? <laughs> the blessings of God on this church are not because of me. They're not because of us. They're because of the investments of the last generation. You and I today are enjoying the fruits, not of our faith or our labor, but their. Which means that what we choose to do today in response to what God is calling us to be, what God is telling us to dream, it'll result in paying forward the blessing to someone after us. It's never about you and me. It's about the ones to come. And if we miss that perspective on what God is doing, what we are as a church, and what we are as individuals, if we miss that, we miss what dreaming is all about. God wants us to dream someone else's future. To think outwardly, forwardly, beyond ourselves, instead of making it all about ourselves. Abram, this land is not for you. It's for those who come after you. The one who says yes to that becomes a patriarch of faith and a source of blessing to untold numbers of people. One more thing in the text, and I'm going to begin to wrap this up. I apologize for taking so long. I'm glad they closed the doors so the smell of the soup doesn't make its way in here, and we have 300 grumbling stomachs at one time. We don't need that. I'm almost done. Did you catch the very first thing? We, we know the first thing God said to Abram when he landed in Canaan. Did you catch the first thing Abram did in response to what God said? Look in verse 7 again. I will give this land to your descendants, the Lord says, and Abram built an altar and worshiped God. He built an altar. An altar, this, this intersection between heaven and earth. And I think when he did that, Abram tapped decisively into God's own dreams for the world. You see, the garden back, all the way back in, in chapter 2, was a place of sanctuary where God's presence and his glory and his majesty dwelt upon the earth. He was making himself known to people. He walked with Adam in the cool of the morning. God of the universe, who created all that is, created a space where you could 
a man and a woman could have fellowship with him, intimate, personal life with God. And all of that was lost. But now in chapter 12, now walks through a sinful world another man who walked with God. He walked with God. He lived for God. He, wa- he followed God in everywhere he went. Everywhere he went, he left behind an altar. A space in a sinful world where God and man could have fellowship again. Whew. If God's dream was to create a space where heaven and earth could come together, then Abram tapped into that dream in a way he never could have imagined when he built that altar and worship. And through Abram's life and, and other people, all people of faith throughout time, through those who respond to him and say yes to him, God's presence and glory is expanding throughout the world one response of faith at a time. Every response of faith expands the presence and the glory and the majesty of God in the world. And this is seen no more clearly than on the cross of Jesus. The Son of God, whose whole life is an eternal yes to the Father. In the shadow of the cross, he prayed, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will be done, but yours. Jesus, in the shadow of the cross, as he was getting ready to bear the weight of every person's sin, not only in this room, but every person who ever lived, as he stood in the shadow of that cross and felt the pressure, he was tempted to say no to God, but instead he said no to myself. I say no to me, I say yes to you, and the fruit of that, life to anyone who believes in him. The same thing at work in Abram's life, comes to completion and fulfillment on the cross of Jesus. You say yes to God and die to yourself and live unto him. You're going to spread God's glory in the world. It's never been more clear than on the cross of Calvary. Jesus said, Father, glorify me in this hour, the hour of his cross. With the glory I had before the world ever existed. That I may glorify you. God moves in the lives of those who say yes to him. And he moves through them to touch the world. As I faced my crisis in college of whether to try to stick around and obey God but not really make any sacrifices, God spoke to me through a man named Tom Halford. Some of you actually may know Tom. I don't know. There's one hand. I know Patrick and I went to the same seminary, so you better know Tom. Tom, uh, at the time, was the vice president of student development, and he was also the the guy who recruited me to come to Mississippi, but he also went on to become a very dear, very dear friend. And he knew the, the decision I was faced with, whether I would follow through with what I knew God was calling me to do, or whether I would try to find some compromise. And he said, Sean, this decision is not a logistical one. This is of simple matter of obedience. That, I'm about to get emotional just thinking about the, 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 the gravity of that statement in my life. This is not a matter of timing or logistics. This is, this is a simple matter of will you obey God or not? Will you do the last thing you heard God tell you or not? You see, Tom knew the call of God in my life was ultimately, really, it wasn't to seminary. The call was to Jesus. God's will for you, God's plan for your life is not to some job, it's not to some spouse, it's not to some ministry, it's not to some place. It is only ever to Jesus. Just like Abram, God's call for my life, for our life as a couple, was not to a destination, but to a person. 
the person of God. Jesus was saying to us, follow me. It doesn't matter where we go. All that matters is to whom you go. Will you come to Jesus? And Becca and I said yes, and we say yes, and we've never looked back. You can go through the motions of being a good Christian all day long and never really be committed to Jesus. But I tell you, as we wrap this service up, we transition to the next thing. Do not leave here until you are willing to say, I will go where you show me. But ultimately, I'm, you are the destination. <laughs> Walking with God is the destination. He's calling you to do that today. He's calling us as a church to do that today, to follow him to the land he will show us. We sang it already. The God who called me here below, you are forever mine. That's what he's calling you to, to make himself yours. I invite you to do that now as the worship team comes to close us out. I'm going to pray. When we're done with the, the closing song, um, I'll come back up here and I'll offer some instruction on what to do next as it pertains to converting this room into a dining room and how we go about going to get the soups and things. I'll, I'll cover all that in a few minutes. But for now, don't you dare change, turn the corner in your mind to, to soup without settling this issue of who you, are you going to follow Jesus or not? No one in here feel like anyone's strong-arming you to do anything. You respond how God is leading you to respond. If he's calling you to respond like Abram and, and trust him and obey him, what better place to do it than here? You can come and pray at an altar. You can pray where you're sit, sit, sitting. You can come ask me. We'll go pray in the prayer. Whatever you want to do, you respond to how he calls you, okay? Let us pray. God, thank you that you love us enough to not leave us wallowing in our brokenness and in our sin. Thank you that you have created us not just to live, but you have great plans for our lives. Good plans. No matter what we've done, no matter how much we have messed things up up to this point, no matter how often we have said no to you and yes to ourselves, Lord, you still stand at the door and knock. And it's your desire that we open the door by faith and receive you in. And you promise to come in and sit down and have a meal together. What a beautiful picture of a life of faith, reclining with the Lord of the universe over a meal. Lord, come and let us feast together. Help every person here to settle this question of whether or not we will follow the call of God or keep living for ourselves. Lord, do something miraculous in someone's heart today, I pray, for your glory and for your sake. In Jesus' name, amen. You respond as God leads you to.